Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. There is a big charge, especially cooking days, and they're excited about when they come out and they get it, they get it, cut whatever they need or pull it out of the ground. You know, they'll even graze on it before we get the vegetables <laughs> into the school. I don't know sometimes if they really knew what to do with us when we said we wanted to build greenhouses at elementary schools. And then when you live in Wyoming with our seasons, it is tough. But we are proving to kids right here. I mean, we're growing our next inventors and scientists. We're proving to kids right here, you can grow all year around and enjoy healthy harvests all year round. It's so different than anything else that they've ever seen or experienced. I think it's good for children of all ages to work hands-on with plants and learn how to plant and grow things at a young age and pass it on through for their children. That kind of learning, is, it, it just lasts forever. School Greenhouses on this Farm to Fork Wyoming. Funding for Farm to Fork Wyoming is provided by viewers like you. Thank you. In schools around Wyoming, there's a growing effort to connect kids back to food from the source. We really decided to concentrate on elementary schools because we felt that, number one, we can make the biggest impact with young kids. If we teach young kids where their foods come from, then they will hopefully change their eating behaviors, their health behaviors, and ultimately create a healthier society. Diabetes is very, very high in our population, so the nutritional values and showing the students, you know, what different healthy foods they need, to, you know, that we need to try to help them, and, you know, and encourage them to eat. We were talking earlier about the little girl who thought potatoes grew on trees, and that was a big, wow, we really need to kind of up our game on teaching where the fresh fruits and vegetables come from. Because they took home ec out of the out of the school districts, which really is very unfortunate because a lot of our students are home by themselves where parents are, you know, parents and family members are out working and making a living and they need to know how to make them something to eat. Every year the Chef's Club and the Greenhouse Club have been our most full clubs of kids really wanting to participate. You know, some of our students come to this class because maybe they don't even know what it is, but they find a love of food through the class because, you know, they've experienced it from seed to salad. It's made me more inspired to like do my own gardening or like produce my own food instead of like relying on other people, like to like rely on myself for what I need. I think the way things are working now, access to much of our food will be a little bit more constrained as population grows. So the closer we can get our food systems to us, well, the less expensive overall I think it's going to be. We're so used to just, oh, we can just import everything. What this project um, specifically has done for our students is not only help them understand from the very beginning of the process of buying seeds and getting things ready, but all the way to um, selling the tomatoes at the farmer's market and having advertising and learning how to sell. It's an idea full of promise, obstacles, and opportunity. Growing in Wyoming is the three months of summer that the kids are out. And so your, your farm doesn't really do what it intended to do. They can plant those outside school gardens and have them ready when they come back to school in order for harvest, but it's really hard because we don't have, we have such a short growing season. You never know when the first um, frost is gonna be in the fall, and you never know when the last frost is gonna be in the spring. So our trick, you know, here in Jackson, we've got a pretty long winter, as most of Wyoming does, and the snows lie deep. And so it was how do we incorporate this farm into the classroom in December, in January, in February, and even March. It's just not conducive to growing, but we can get enough sunlight, we can move it inside. If we're enclosed, we can grow something. 
as long as it's protected from the wind and the freezing weather. And having a greenhouse gives that season extension. And a four season greenhouse like this one, which has climate control, um, so it has the cooling in the summer, the cooling wall in the summer, it has the heaters in the winter, makes it, makes it so important that it keeps a constant temperature. And with careful planning and design, year-round harvest is possible even without a heat source. We've had great success in seeding in August and September and then being able to harvest in December and January. Fresh greens in an unheated greenhouse. From Arapaho to Jackson and Casper, each school has found a different path to success. The Casper Community Greenhouse Project has filled a void in stewardship for a couple of schools. The Casper Community Greenhouse Project started about 2012, and their hope was to do community gardens and teaching um, facilities, greenhouses, so that we could grow year-round and let people know where their food came from, etc. And there were some other projects that were going on that kind of fulfilled some of those needs. So we really decided to concentrate on elementary schools. We've been working with uh, Principal Logan for quite some time. They had a greenhouse already. Hey friends, let's take this into Miss Red so she can you make your it? salad. All right. All right. They were instrumental in coming in and getting that set up, getting things starting, getting it to be pro producing. And so what we did was just kind of help them. We partnered with several different people, the FFA from the high school, Star Lane School, some other ones to kind of build and plant and grow and build their outdoor learning center. Well then, obviously, the school district decided to close some schools. Fortunately, the greenhouse commitment was able to continue. We had promised that when they moved into whatever their new school, we would help them build a full classroom style teaching greenhouse. So as we moved, we were able to put this greenhouse, that's twice the size of the first original greenhouse at Mills. And it has been up now, we're in our second year of starting to really have great production. But it took some time. This, this building took a while to get built. And, um, and there were some issues with some of the land and so in the middle of that um, we we did work with Evansville Elementary School so we now have two. Both of these greenhouses are now part of the school day and after school activities. Like that one. Right. Do you see it? Ah. We have a working greenhouse club that meets weekly. They plant, they study the plants, they look at all the different systems so they can see many different systems that will provide food. Um, with that, they then also take the produce from here and they cook it in their chef's club. So we have a couple clubs that run just out of this greenhouse. Ready. Now it's in full, full glory, so to speak. It's, it's up and running and now we're working on getting it into full production. And the day-to-day -day functioning of these greenhouses is sustained by a greenhouse manager. That's where I came in mainly was to monitor the systems. Um, here we have the hydroponic system, as well as our soil beds. This was originally an aquaponic system, but it's called a flood and drain. We have a reservoir. Um, this ordinarily, if it were an aquaponic, it would accommodate fish. This would be a fish tank. The tray fills with water and then it drains. And then it refills, of course, the nutrients. The roots are bathed in the nutrient solution. The rail system. This is a, uh, actually considered an aeroponic that just sprays water laterally across the roots. And then the roots themselves, they just grow down into the nutrient solution. And here we're just using a, uh, a simple uh, liquid nutrients. It's a two-part system we use. The first one provides mostly your, your nitrogen and the majority of what you need for good healthy green growth. Then there's a secondary which adds a little more of the phosphorus which is necessary for fruiting. And with soil beds using vermiculture for nutrients, the kids can also see a regenerative nutrient cycle in action. We put in these raised beds just this fall. The idea is to have a system where all you have to do is add compost. And the greens we're going to put into the compost. 
We have a composting system. It's a vermiculture, which is a worm composting. You mean this? Yeah. Remember? The one with worms? Ew! Right. Ew! What they leave is a nice black, rich compost right down here at the bottom. It'll all break down to really nice mulch like this, um, which we can just add directly to the soil beds. Okay, now it's just getting so much easier. Yeah. So with this greenhouse, of course, everything is geared towards going in their snack program. So we do a lot of salads and, and that sort of thing. And the kids are just eating it up. To me, it was really important um, to get them using hands-on because I could see the wealth of learning, not only that, but really just instilling that, that love of growing your own food and harvesting the food that's, that's right here close to us. This is um, Miss Red Clark. She is our lunch clerk and what she does is she takes all the produce out of our greenhouse and she makes beautiful salads as our produce keeps production. She just keeps rolling salads out during lunchtime for the students. And I've heard so many kids who say to me, well, we really, I really hate vegetables, but this is really good. Okay, so that's not a vegetable. That is your produce that you're growing here. <laughs> and the second greenhouse in Evansville has a similar variety of growing systems. This is Evansville Elementary. So this one's been in full growing for about five years. So we've learned a lot with this one. This one was totally built by volunteers. But the philosophies between the two schools is kind of interesting because this one does a large variety of, of plants. We have flowers, we have um, tropicals, we have aloes, we have lots of plants that are grafting. We have a, a mother coleus. Here we're focusing more on ecological niches. We can demonstrate arid requirement plants, subtropical, tropical, Mediterranean. And so they can get an idea of connecting plants to environments. They use more science, math, and et cetera in grafting and propagating and, and learning, you know, how to take a, a cutting from one plant and, and seed it and, and get it to grow, that sort of thing. Whereas at Journey, we're, we're concentrating on production, especially for their, their snack program. Now here we do have obviously the tomatoes that are growing and um, we use kind of an Amish style of, of growth for the tomatoes and the kids pick a gallon of them, they're gone. I'm a professional tomato picker. <laughs> The, the kids just love them. So we still have carrots and we still have vegetables and we still have things like that that are growing because they're using all the different methods. Dirt, aquaponics, and, and different styles of, of dirt grow. Wait, look at this one. Those look amazing. We've had some grade levels build uh, beds outside. We've had their grade levels planting things. And so every kid's had a chance to get in here and kind of experience what it's like to take something from planting and to see what the end result is, uh, some, some final production kind of things. We have the aquaponic system in here, which comes from the two words, aquaculture, which is raising fish, and then hydroponics, which is raising soilless um, plant growth. Okay, and this combines the two. So we don't need to add nutrients to the water because we're using the fish waste as our nutrient. And then of course we have the outdoor beds, which of course we can't grow in the winter. Um, they, again, we have to have the greenhouse in order to extend those seasons and, and move that. So what we're trying to do is get these kids an idea of the variety of growing situations, uh, requirements, how we can do workarounds to those, and the different systems that are available to us. But really it's the kids who come out and do all the planting and the kids who are coming out and doing the harvesting and that sort of thing with guidance from us all. Um, we have a couple of very dedicated greenhouse champions and so it's really important that you have someone at the school that that's passionate about this sort of thing because without that team it's really hard to you know to bring the whole thing together. In Arapaho 
The after-school program has been cultivating their elementary school growers for over six years now. We got a new school built in 2011 and the greenhouse was a part of it. And it was never utilized and finally we got a superintendent in that was big on agriculture. We started with some little garden boxes, four by four, and it's just growing from there. First off, go measure and see how wide, it is. make sure these are not longer. We incorporate academics through enrichment classes. So through the gardening program with science, okay, water, you know, plant okay. life, plant cycles. Paper towel planting. So what you guys are gonna do, you're gonna take the glue, and you're gonna go run it right down the middle. We do a lot of social emotional learning. You don't want your glue to dry out. Sure. I started a little mentoring program so, this year. Alana, hold your hand out. Really breaking up my um, older fifth graders and I have a lot of fifth, fourth and fifth graders and I've just let them take care of the kindergarten and the first and the second graders and just, you know, okay, you know, this is what's going to happen and explain it to them and it has really grown them up. So it looks different than the regular school day. We would do two days of gardening, two days of cooking. We show them how to cook, teach them the ways to cook and to grow their own veggies. And then the Charlie cart has a curriculum too. And a lot of that is fresh cooking. So like the parsley, a lot of, a lot of herbs, fresh herbs. So the kids will come out and pick the herbs and then we'll go back and cook with it. Wait, do we break up the leaves too? This portable cooking cart supplies the tools to teach the cooking skills. It has been so wonderful. It is equipped for 30 students, and we go from basic knife skills on up. And so it has been wonderful just to show them everything, and they have used everything on the cart. We also partner with our backpack program. So we get food from the um, food bank of the Rockies and every weekend they get sent food bags home. So we'll take those foods and incorporate it into cooking and also like whatever herbs we have, you know, so that way they know that they can cook stuff out of the, the backpacks they have. We had a grandmother come back and say that Monty fixed dinner for the whole family from the food we sent home and how we taught him to use it. Yeah, we got, we got Mr. Worm right here. Yeah, worms are, they, they keep stuff fresh. They, they, I they forgot help, about the worms. They help, they help Earth breathe. Yeah. I find a big one. <gasps> We've also made like a lot of winter salad where we've roasted some veggies, the Brussels sprouts. We've roasted some um, peppers and cabbage and broccoli and put it in a salad mix. And they, it's amazing. They just love it. You know, if you, if you brought it to them from the store, they wouldn't even touch it. But knowing and seeing that they have had their hands in it and been able to water and take care of it, they really love to, they love to eat stuff that they've grown. the garden has even provided in times of need. When they had the big lettuce recall, we had enough greens in the greenhouse that our salad bar stayed open. We came out and they're like, oh, we don't have any lettuce. Everybody's like, we do. We came out and we cut it and yeah, we supplied the cafeteria for three or four days. We have an awesome um, cafeteria staff who will wash everything up for us and put it on and then um, let our students and staff have fresh veggies right off from our greenhouse. The microgreens are a big hit. It's like the kids that grow them will get the other kids, here, try this, this is really good. And they go fast and the staff loves them. The rapper word is uh, We have an elder that works in our program, in our gardening and cooking program. And he gives us the Arapaho words for what we're doing. He talks to the kids in Arapaho, tells them what they're doing. They call them carrots. But the rapper word is uh, that's what carrots are. Yay, nay, nay. And then when we do put our produce on the salad bar, we label it 21st century produce, and then we put the Arapaho names. The biggest thing I think for a school garden to work is just having the admin on, on your side. You know, we got the support of a lot of people. In Jackson, 
The Summit High School science teacher has put the greenhouse at the heart of his curriculum. I've, I've taught out of a textbook before. I've, I've taught using web resources and video before. But there's no substitute for, for doing it yourself. We've had other greenhouses um, in the district that have not been as successful as Brian's. And I think what it really comes down to in my kind of perspective on it is really that teacher-driven passion and then the supports and the resources to back it up. And my neighbor teacher, Susan Mick, was like, hey, let's, let's plant a garden this morning. It's, it's a nice day out. And I was like, brilliant, you know? And we started and then, of course, left for the summer. Came back full of weeds. The kids were excited to pull carrots out of the ground. So it was kind of like, aha, that was good. And we didn't have to get a school bus to go outside and do that. I want to do more of this. Just, yeah, in, in the garden, digging up plants. It's amazing. And so we just started building more garden beds. And I'd say most science standards could easily be taught in the framework of a garden. Because it's, it's the unified view of all of these sciences woven together and life is coming out of it. I mean, if you can't find a way to use that in biology, earth science, environmental science, physical science, I don't know where you can find a way to, to cover those standards. You know, having students build an 18-day compost and literally turn it from dead plant material and nitrogen into workable soil, you'll never forget that. And just the inquiry that comes along with gardening just lends itself to that way of thinking. With the help of capable high school students, a greenhouse was built. I was lucky that my students built it with me as part of a class. And I had a lot of help to do that. And the other teachers in the school were totally willing to like let students who were done with something in their class be like, hey, can I go help on the greenhouse project? Because I just finished X, Y, and Z. And then boop, they would pop out and grab a hammer and start working. Kids that were involved in the year and a half build out look back on that saying like, that was the coolest thing I did in high school. And they'll come in and check on it, just pop in and poke their head in the greenhouse and they're, they're always jazzed to see that it's still going. Because that's the legacy that they've left behind. Another chapter in hands-on learning came with COVID in the spring of 2020. This spring when uh, we all fled the buildings in our own ways, I was struggling mentally with what to do with this ag class. We had a lot of things growing in here. <laughs> we had five stories of starts. We had a worm composting garden tower and tomatoes that we had been cloning from last October. So it was a jungle. And then all of a sudden, poof, we're all out. And then realized, like, this actually might be kind of cool. What if every student starts a mini farm wherever they are? And so I put this very vague assignment out to them on a, on a Zoom meeting, start a farm, grow something. And I was blown away by what the students were doing. Um, you know, and it did go from like literally a shoebox full of dirt with some microgreens to full on like vegetable farming. Like building compost, building beds, clearing rocks, you know, learning about frost tolerance and zapping their squash plants in like May. And it really was cool to, to have them all get engaged on their own like that. Mm -hmm. And then I was kind of zipping around, dropping off seeds covertly, like putting them on the doorstep and ringing the bell and running and getting them the supplies that they didn't have because I didn't want to make cost a prohibitive piece of this. You know, like you were in school, you didn't have to buy your stuff. And the results were fantastic. We also have the luxury as an alternative school of creating a schedule um, and a small class size. Um, and we also do a lot of social emotional education, provide experiences and opportunities for these kids to, to be kids and to socialize with a goal in mind and to, to move forward together. I think we all know that relationships are at the core of student success. And um, the stronger the relationship between the student and the teacher, the more effective um, the learning can be and the greater outcomes. And this is such a low stakes environment to do that, you know, the garden. You mess up, 
that plant might not live, but guess what? I got a thousand seeds over here. Redos are totally okay. And with agriculture, whether it's in a school, in your backyard, in a forest, you know, it's, it's a great example of where just a little bit of intention and a little bit of a design can lead to amazing regenerative effects. With all of the learning that's involved with the hydroponics, the aquaponics, and all the different ways that kids can grow things, there's so many science, science experiments, there's so many math and just real world connections right here in this greenhouse that's just steps away from the school. It's been an awesome program for our students just to teach hands-on, which most of our children are hands-on learners. They soon start to learn that that's the best way that they can learn, is to like try and fail and think and work together to find a solution, to move forward, and then to see that it works or it didn't work. Like, that's science right there. If we expose them to it now, it's, it's a big, it's a lots of fun. You know, you pull a carrot out of the ground and it's, oh, it's a wow moment, you know? And then our hope is that they'll go on um, and move into the next phases at middle school, at high school, etc. You know, I think agriculture has a huge future here in, the, in Wyoming. And um, indoor is one way to do that. Eventually we have, we have little egg, we have agriculture, you know, and then we have a natural progression of a diversification of, of the agriculture business. This episode of Farm to Fork Wyoming is available. Order online at shop.wyomingpbs.org. This program was produced by Wyoming PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. To learn more and watch Wyoming PBS programs online, visit us at wyomingpbs.org.